Hello, welcome to my next presentation, the faction of agnosticism, Kanya versus Huxley. After 150 years, agnosticism to the bean, time for new definitions. Before considering yourself an agnostic to avoid explicit declaration concerning your attitude to the existence of God, try to understand the term agnosticism in the context of meaning of the world existence, application to imaginary, in other words delusional beings or only real ones, and definition of agnosticism coined by Huxley in 1869, according to which, generally speaking, we cannot state with certainty the falsehood or truthfulness of some judgments, and with this we can agree, but only in relation to the real beings, not the delusional ones. In the context of the word existence, to better understand it, let's ask the question. Does the God exist? Atheists will answer, no, God does not exist. Theists will certainly state, yes, God exists. Huxley's agnostics will not either confirm or deny the existence of God, answering directly, I don't know, because I have no knowledge. But does this question make any sense? There is only one answer the question asks is senseless inter alia because there are no real and true attributes of God. We don't know who we are asking about, so we don't know who or what God is and what his physical parameters are, which would allow to formulate an ambiguous definition of God consistent with the essence of the real physical world. This results in the fact that each believer perceives God differently. As a consequence, believers multiply the divine being, creeping their brains with Occam's razor, according to which beings should not be multiplied beyond the necessity, and by identifying the various images of God created in their minds, which are not identical, they break the well-known Quine's principle that says no entity without identity. This is hardly surprising since the definition of the world God is to restrict it, devoid it of meaning attributes, which classifies this definition into the category of pseudo definitions found in myths and fairy stories. It is therefore senseless to raise the question of God's existence. Well, theology is self-destructive because, on the one hand, it claims without proof based on revelations or statements of the so-called authorities, which as known are deprived of the evidential value referring to the physical existence of God, and on the other hand, by crediting God with the attributes of the perfectness, theology contradicts the laws of nature, degrading God to a mythical figure imagined by our ignorant and barbarous ancestors whose knowledge was limited to magic and witchcraft, as David Hume was writing in his books a few centuries ago. Moreover, being confident that we know who is the God we are asking about, we are assuming a false premise, thus committing a material fallacy, because we should first have to define the concept of God on the basis of the real, true attributes, and then ask the question about the God's existence. All this doesn't prevent any God from existing in myths and not existing in the reality at the same time, because the word existence is not a real predicate, thus it cannot be an essential, uniquely determined property of anything which is consistent with the Kant's maxim according to which the term existence does not clearly define where God might exist. As a creation of the human minds, God can only exist in the myths and in the minds of believers, but not in the real world. And this is in line with the Kanye's principle of 
coexistence of independent beings according to which God exists for believers and does not exist for non-believers. It is generally known that none of us has the knowledge to fully understand the reality. On the other hand, the essence of nature constitutes itself an impossible barrier that prevents us from knowing it deeper. Cognizing the reality, however, differs from cognizing the imaginary events and beings just as facts and science differ from miracles and religious myths, which results from the Kanye's law of value of independent beings based on the laws of nature. Huxley simply confused the concepts that require diametrically opposed methods of cognition because of the nature of the things they refer to. After all, the reality is cognized by experience and reason, which makes it possible to explore reality more and more deeply, whereas the religious reality is cognized by the faith, based more on non-rational than irrational perception of the world and the for has no cognitive value. The argumentation address concerning the existence or non-existence of God discredits the substantive value of religious agnosticism. Agnosticism based on such non-rational grounds is senseless and proves intellectual inertia and lack of willingness to understand things. Above all, agnosticism robs people of courage to adopt the clear-cut position to the root of the matter referring to the existence or non-existence of God. On the other hand, in the context of the real beings, such as nature, agnosticism is the most appropriate term corresponding to the essence of nature and the human's cognitive abilities, and only to this extent the term agnosticism makes sense which imposes the necessity to clarify this term. Thus is Huxley's definition of agnosticism abstaining from opinion due to the lack of sufficient rational grounds to confirm or to deny the existence of God correct just because it has many followers among whom there are even well-known scientists such as Russell, agnostic for a philosophical audience Atheist for the ordinary man, gold, unbelieving agnostic, claiming I am not a believer, I am an agnostic, Dawkins, counting himself as agnostic in category 6 but leaning towards 7, known for the agnostic statement, God almost certainly doesn't exist, Hartman, a Krakowian philosopher, honest agnostic with no pride, who says that agnosticism is an attitude of intellectual honesty. An agnostic says, if God existed, he would expect me to be an agnostic, because I really don't know. It is arrogance to pretend to know something you don't know. Is it possible that Huxley and academics who share his agnostic view concerning religion intentionally ignore the scientific knowledge, declaring themselves religious agnostics only because to preserve the status quo concerning the natural view on the existence of God? After all, how can we accuse academics that their scientific knowledge, which as we know discredits the substantive value of religious agnosticism, wouldn't allow them to draw the conclusive conclusions from their considerations. Every common sense person, especially academic, when asked about the real, I mean physical, existence of God should answer in the way proposed by Professor Barbara Stanus, this question makes no sense, or I have no idea what the question is about, but in no case I don't know, which is typical of almost certainly agnostics, such as for example Richard Dawkins, who is paradoxically considered by some to be the king of the atheist or the pope of the atheist, what borders on paranoia. 
But why would atheist need the king or the pope, who in addition is an agnostic, another idol to admire? It is nothing more than vanity funded on the prevailing view to adjulent authorities promoted by media. Well, the masses have always needed the allowing profits, even if it made them look ridiculous. Infatuation with Dawkins is a classic case of emotivistic behavior of his followers in which irrationalism and emotion prevail over the objective assessment of the express views. Such a state of mind can be caused by overvalued idea that means an untrue or exaggerated sustained belief beyond reason and logic. An ordinary man being under influence of the overvalued idea, infatuated with the admired guru and strongly convinced of his wisdom, experiences so-called the syndrome of greatness, becoming the soldier of guru. And this is a sign of the extreme state of mind leading the soldier to blind fanaticism and hatred of people of opposite views. This kind of behavior is typical among the members of the masses, including a large group of common people who, in order to increase their self-confidence and secure own future, prefer to follow generally prevailing trends and ideas preached to the public by authorities who are notably created by media, rather than follow logic and reason. Such a group of people called the masses, although consist mainly of a significant number of members coming from the lower class society in the social hierarchy, it also comprises people from the upper socio-economic class, including well-educated members. Unfortunately, the masses constitute the majority of our global society. That's why we should not be surprised when we see around us more ignorance and conformists than intelligent people able and willing to distinguish the reality from delusion. It is outrageous how academics can claim to be religious agnostics. It looks like they make a mockery of human intelligence which allows to distinguish religious fiction from the reality. Is it appropriate for scientists, notably from the world-famous universities, to declare themselves religious agnostics? In the context of the presented facts, argumentation discredits the substantive value of the religious agnosticism and thus classifies the religious agnosticism as senseless, while in the case of agnosticism related to the real world, argumentation corresponds to the essence of the real world, in other words, nature and the human cognitive capabilities. And only to this extent agnosticism makes sense which imposes the necessity to clarify this term and create new definitions as follows. In relation to the real beings, the following term shall be used, Kanye's real agnosticism, in short, vero agnost. This view expresses uncertainty as to the final knowledge of the physically existing beings. It results from the limitations imposed by the essence of the real world and the human cognitive capabilities, enabling to learn about the reality only to a limited extent. By identifying as veroagnos, one expresses the view of limited knowledge of understanding the reality. This, however, does not result from the human knowledge, even if it is very advanced, but from the limitations coming from the human mind and the nature itself. Therefore, classifying yourself as veroagnos is the most appropriate corresponding to the essence of things. In relation to the existence or non-existence of God, the following term shall be used, Kanye's intermediarism, in short, intermediarism. 
this view expresses uncertainty as to the existence or non-existence of God by a person who does not want or cannot reveal his atheistic worldview or does not have the knowledge that would allow to draw the conclusive conclusions when choosing a worldview. Although qualifying yourself in this category is senseless and many people may be aware of it, being an intermediarist protects against the social alienation and allows to avoid labeling as an atheist, which even today happens to be wrongly connoted evil. However, the intermediarist exposes to ridicule when presents such the religious view to the advanced scientific community that has the knowledge to distinguish fiction from the reality, what Huxley has not mentioned about when defining the religious agnosticism. In relation to the religious atheist, the following term shall be used. Kanye's interstatism. In short, interstatism. This view is expressed by a person who, due to the tradition, social circumstances, family or his own preferences, supports a church financially and actively participates in religious rituals, no hiding his atheism. And finally, in relation to the changeable religious views, the following term shall be used. Kanye's astatism, in short, astatism, which expresses a changeable view on the existence of God depending on the situation. But who would publicly fall into this category? Who would want to be considered a two-faced person? You can present yourself as an intermediarist or interstotic, hoping for acceptance, but no one would dare to admit that is aesthetic. Nevertheless, such people exist, which justifies the creation of this category that means Kanye aesthetism. It looks that after more than 150 years, Huxley's religious agnosticism qualifies only to be trashed, so time for new definitions. In concluding this presentation, we should realize the fact that on the contrary to scientific views which concern the natural real world and are based on reason and logic following facts and reliable evidence, religious views concerning man-made supernatural world are based on the faith which doesn't require any evidence. That's why it was necessary to clarify the term agnosticism coined by Huxley and finally to formulate new definitions appropriate for religion and science. Ultimately, it's up to you to decide which category you classify your religious views into, Huxley's religious agnosticism or the appropriate category of Kani. Thanks for watching my presentation. Goodbye.